So I'm trying to expand a bit this uh, doctor's view, although already Hannes uh, Jürgens and uh, Markus Wigima have, have uh, spoken uh, quite in details in our uh, regarding our national pilot that was uh, recently completed. So um, I was just thinking uh, if we have already 20% of this uh, adult population in Estonia joined the biobank and having them sign the broad consent and we know that there is a lot of public awareness and a lot of support for the biobank so could we uh, start thinking about uh, the biobank as a society model where uh, pre-existing genomic data is available for everybody and um, actually there are of course a, a couple of concerns so first of all, uh, the data now comes from the from the research uh, studies. So does it actually meet the quality requirements uh, needed in the medical system and healthcare? Mm. On the other perspective, is it actually worth that we now start approaching the participants with uh, talking to them about uh, some risk factors they may not even be aware of? Is it also justified for both uh, high and moderate risks? Um, is there a chance that the participants could benefit uh, to they actually start doing something or to their medical doctors start doing something? Are the participants able to cope uh, with the genetic findings which uh, by nature are lifelong? And of course, uh, we cannot leave uh, the participants uh, with alone with the risk factors, we should also see that that the healthcare is able to adopt them as patients. So those are, are the concerns. But our current experience, our current experience from the data return studies actually shows that uh, this is uh, quite largely true. That uh, we, we we can think about the biobank as uh, as a society model with uh, having this genetic data and and, and we are able to introduce uh, the ways and how the data could be used uh, for the good of the participants and, and for the being patients then. Estonian healthcare and legislation is very much supportive for this kind of approach. Uh, so by the law, the participants have right to access their data and there is also uh, prohibition for any kind of genetic discrimination um, and also it's very important that we have a solidarity based healthcare so eventually there could be uh, a win-win situation for all the stakeholders So I start uh, with the breast cancer projects. We have had a couple of them. And uh, we did first actually a uh, small scale biobank pilot with uh, just BRCA1 and 2 findings. Uh, and we started with uh, NG NGS data set that we had already some five or six years ago and uh, started looking on those uh, findings in the data, data set and, and contacting the, the patients. And just recently at this time, also the, the ACMG guidelines were uh, published where uh, data return was uh, encouraged for patients in a clinical setting independent of the gender and age for the actionable disorders. And what we saw, we contacted actually 22 uh, uh, participants and we saw that just one family out of 22 had been previously consulted. So there is indeed an enormous unmet need, I would say, for this kind of approach. Although we know that prakas uh, were addressed uh, in the medical system in Estonia for 10 and more years, just one of the 22 families had been uh, counseled for those findings, what we saw from the biobank pilot. 
Um, the next question is in the clinical setting that there are um, guidelines. Who should be tested um, if there is no pre existing genetic data? And we saw that just eight out of uh, the 22 participants actually qualified for this high risk uh, assessment according to NCCN criteria, which are broadly used also in Estonia. So uh, less than one, around one third. Um, from the psychosocial uh, aspect, we saw that 20 out of 21 council page participants appreciated being contacted. Uh, we lost uh, one of the participants uh, and she had some uh, 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 psychiatric illness and she didn't respond to invites to the second uh, counseling. And she had also a very, uh, her sister was very much interested in having this data. And luckily she got uh, involved in our uh, national pilot, which followed a couple of years. Uh, later. So relatives of 20, 10 participants also underwent the casket screening in the biobank setting, uh, showing that we can expand our scope even beyond the uh, participants. And um, five out of 16 eligible female carriers chose to undergo the risk reduction surgery and at least 10 then adhere to surveillance recommendations over the 30 month follow up period. So I would say that they provided us uh, quite a bit of uh, useful information. I can show also the overview of the, okay, what are the uh, risk levels for uh, uh, BRCA1 and 2 carriers? Uh, they are indeed high risk findings. And uh, uh, for the breast cancer, uh, it's estimated that uh, females would have uh, 60 and more percent of li lifelong incidence. Uh, for ovarian cancer, the incidence is a bit lower, but uh, uh, it's also uh, a much worse prognosis disease uh, due, due to the uh, lack of um, a suitable screening method there. So this is the overview of the families. And uh, I will also show you the pedigree view of this uh, one family that we uh, that had previously been contacted uh, in the clinical setting. And there is really not that much uh, cancer cases that we see but it was just an older lady who had uh, with a breast cancer at advanced age and her daughter has had uh, ovarian cancer in much younger age. And then uh, the granddaughter was worried and then she came actually to counseling uh, to clinical geneticist. And um, actually it shows that uh, there are not so many uh, cancer cases that we see uh, in those high risk families even, and it's very hard to detect them if we are not expanding uh, uh, the target groups. So next, uh, going to the national feasibility pilot, uh, as uh, Hannes Jürgens already showed that we, have uh, performed it in two arms. So I was mostly working in this um, mutation group, uh, uh, participants and patients and counseling them. So overall we counseled 109 uh, women in a clinical uh, genetics and oncology setting. Uh, the other arm was then for the uh, polygenic risk Uh, so what is the distribution of um, mutations uh, in genes, uh, the risk levels and the experience from prior counseling? In this study, uh, most of the participants had findings in uh, BRCA1 gene. Uh, then came the BRCA2 gene mutations and uh, one third or a bit actually less, uh, one fourth is uh, 
is a check two finding some moderate risk gene. So uh, here we also see the risk levels, most are high risk. And going to the prior counseling experience, uh, just 10% of the families have, have had then prior counseling in a clinical setting. So I think uh, we are still confident that there is um, a large unmet need and actually the clinical work could be organized better. It's not just a question of, uh, of clinical geneticists, but also the question on, on how oncologists uh, approach their patients and, and how much there is a public awareness also in the primary care level who will be uh, then referred to the specialty doctor's counseling. So we also studied actually uh, more genes uh, which were listed in the NCCN uh, guidelines, but uh, in many of those, we didn't have any findings um, validated. Of course, I, I cannot tell that it's a comprehensive overview of all the high risk or moderate risk variants in the biobank. It's, it was also the question that uh, we chose the most obvious candidates uh, for validation and uh, the patients were only, or participants were only counseled if there was a, a double uh, evidence from the biobank. We had, had confirmed the findings with the different approach, different method. And uh, before the patients had any kind of uh, data returned, uh, they also donated a new blood sample and then it was tested in the clinical lab for the final confirmation of uh, all those monogenic variants. So uh, we really validated them very carefully. And luckily, there was actually no mismatch with the biobank findings uh, uh, found in the clinical setting. The other was then uh, the top 5% of polygenic risk score participants increasing the risk level uh, to the average population average roughly two and a half times. And then we started mammography in this group uh, 10 years earlier compared to the gold standard of 50 years. What are the cancer cases uh, um, discovered? Well, I, I would uh, uh, like to indicate to you that in this mutation group, and if we look at the breast cancer in history, uh, at least one third of cases uh, seem to be seem to occur uh, beyond this 50 magical 50 years of age, which is currently uh, stated in several clinical guidelines as the uh, decision point between the monogenic and uh, polygenic cancers. So. We think at least in Estonia, the, the um, target groups could be advanced uh, uh, here as well. So uh, what uh, happens with the ovarian cancer, they are um, recommended for clinical counseling uh, independent of the age. And then we also had 10 new cancers dis discovered in the high PRS group, and mostly uh, they were in higher PRS values uh, and uh, uh, over half of them were discovered uh, at more advanced age. So also here, I think if we think uh, if we are going to the service models, we should expand those target groups for both younger and more advanced age, not discontinue uh, the screening at uh, 69 years. Uh, we had at least one breast cancer discovered in the high uh, in the mutation group. Uh, what I've heard is that uh, there is also actually another cancer uh, discovered as well. So we are still collecting those results. Going to the psychosocial aspects, uh, Lise will have more uh, talk about uh, this uh, from other feedback projects as well, but um, 
just comparing the mutation and the high PRS profiles here, I could tell that, uh, that people are uh, largely able to cope with the findings, although there is uh, a bit less uh, confidence uh, uh, in the mutation group. And it can be also well understood because after having this, uh, these mutations confirmed, what happens is that they get immediately also a list of family members who should uh, uh, be evaluated as well and, and a much more uh, strict uh, screening program for them adjusted for this uh, high risk monogenic uh, findings. But overall, they all valued uh, the results, I could tell. So a few examples also on the uh, cardiovascular disease projects. Starting with a familial hypercholesteremia, we published a study a couple of years ago in the biobank subjects. And uh, then we also uh, consulted them in two major hospitals in Estonia. So it's a um, uh, metabolic defect where people are not able to metabolize their elevated, uh, their LDL cholesterol in liver. And uh, then this uh, the LDL levels stay elevated constantly in bloodstream and it is a severe risk factor for uh, atherosclerosis. And I can also uh, show here what we saw, uh, uh, what, what were the uh, cholesterol levels in uh, participants with no um, uh, genetic findings, no findings in FH-related genes and then uh, in, with findings in FH-related genes, and there is actually a large overlap. So even if the clinical guidelines uh, advise that uh, the cholesterol level is uh, one um, decision point in uh, referring those people to uh, FH testing, it's actually quite hard to distinguish because uh, a lot of uh, people with um, um, FH-related findings actually could have quite moderate increase in their LDL uh, uh, levels in blood. And actually, it's also uh, due to this, there is also a large unmet need, uh, and it's the disease is severely underdiagnosed. And it's actually quite common, we estimate that uh, it's roughly one in 200 uh, also in Estonian population. I can tell that also the, uh, the monogenic uh, breast cancer related findings, they appear to uh, be present in more than well, one in 200 uh, individuals. So it's not a rare disease. So what happened, uh, what was the situation with the participants uh, before study and after the study? So pre-study, um, the, the majority had no diagnosis. Uh, some had uh, uh, common hypercholesterolemia or polygenic hypercholesterolemia being diagnosed. Very few had uh, uh, FH diagnosis. Uh, after study, uh, they were regarded as FH patients. And it also affected uh, the therapy before the study. Majority had no uh, lipid lowering treatment at all or had uh, mostly a moderate intensity statin being prescribed after study, either high intensity or moderate intensity statin were described in at least two thirds of the participants with uh, genetic findings. And me, I hate to interrupt you, just to yes. let you know, we're running slightly over time now. So okay, okay. Mm -hmm. it's yes. fascinating, yeah. I don't want to rush you too much. Mm -hmm. Okay, you. but uh, but those slides uh, were uh, also shown by Markus Wiegema uh, regarding this uh, high PRS and cardiovascular diseases. Um, uh, uh, we had intervention group and control group. We compared uh, uh, other risk factors as well, uh, what, uh, what happened to them in the, after intervention. Uh, this cardiocompensy tool was used for counseling. The good uh, thing is indeed that doctors are able 
to accommodate those clinical decision support uh, software in their everyday uh, work. Over 85% of physicians appreciated using it, and uh, so it's really helpful in patient counseling. There are uh, positive trends with um, um, uh, LDL levels and total cholesterol levels in those patients that were uh, statistically significant and also positive trends with other risk factors, uh, blood pressure and uh, percentage of smokers, for example. Okay. Uh, the patient feelings were largely uh, positive in this study. Uh, so going to conclusions, I would tell that uh, we think that uh, the biobank has a large scale, uh, involving large scale of fat population could really support implementation of precision prevention and then personalized healthcare. Uh, genetics first approaches with a careful planning and counseling are fully feasible for clinical interventions and they're also justified Whenever possible, uh, we think that the monopolygenic findings and risks uh, should be communicated in parallel because for people, it's just genetics. They don't understand uh, initially what is the difference. And uh, we see that majority of participants consider the risk information useful and can manage uh, with this. And we also think that the clinical guidelines have to be revised for those uh, not having uh, this genetic uh, information readily available because uh, the medicine has to be operate, could be operating uh, much better. So thanks a lot uh, for the collaborators and, and uh, colleagues.